Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to part three of the clinical biomarkers class. I'm really glad to be working with you on this. Um, last two, well, on Tuesday, two days ago, we were talking about the use of proteomics methods, particularly shotgun proteomics methods, as a way to discover new uh, protein possible, uh, new, new candidate biomarkers for particular disease conditions. You'll remember that on Tuesday we talked about the importance of moving away from shotgunning to a process of verification by targeted proteomics, targeted quantitation of particular proteins. So that's really great, um, but again, even though targeted quantitation is a, uh, a, a much lower variability technique for quantifying particular proteins, it's really important in the clinic to have a low price test and one that you can perform at the site uh, if possible. So using mass spectrometry as part of the test in, in, in uh, a large cohort is not a very good option. So having moved from shotgun methods to targeted, verifi targeted verification or quantitation, we next want to have a test for protein presence that is cheap and reproducible and very low in variability. So um, today we're going to talk about immunoassays, one of the most common strategies used for that. So uh, we're going to start by just defining what these things are. We will move from there to talk about how antibodies bind specific antigens. Who here has had an immunology class? Oh, good. All right. Well, so I may rely on you to teach parts of this. <laughs> it's all right. I actually missed that class when I was in grad school, and I have regretted it ever since. All right. So we're going to talk about antibodies binding specific antigens. We're going to understand some different labeling strategies that are used for making detections from this. And we'll describe the differences between ELISA and Luminex assays, a rather um, uh, high-tech way of performing multiplex uh, immunoassays talk about whole blood assays and why they're important, talk about lateral flow assays, and then finally talk about some of the different sample types and how they interact with these immunoassays. Okay, so generally speaking, an immunoassay is going to be built around a, a molecule that can detect the presence of another with a, particular, a particularly high degree of specificity. That's almost always going to be built on antibodies. So uh, it's not the only way that you could do this sort of thing. So a, a biochemical test that identifies and measures a specific molecule, an analyte, in a biological background, serum, urine, plasma, something like that. So we, we want to be able to make this, this kind of identification and quantification. We need to be able to cover a broad range of analytes that are out there. Sometimes we want to measure a lipid, a hormone, a peptide, a protein. Any of those are reasonable targets. And it's got to be something that we can use really, really broadly because there are lots of people for which we need to perform this kind of assay. Making it something that is both qualitative and quantitative. Do people understand why, why those would be different? To, to be able to say this is present versus how much of it is present is a really big distinction for making decisions. And it needs to be high throughput. Tests where you have to wait two weeks for your samples to go bake, a, bake in a lab somewhere is not, are not a great uh, possible um, strategy. So the immune response is uh, where we're basically getting our source of molecules, where we're getting these antibodies uh, for the recognition of, of molecules. So we, our bodies all, are always subject to different kinds of attacks, right? If you, uh, if you uh, eat some, some bad shellfish and your body responds uh, very negatively to that, it could be an immune response. Uh, if you are in, infected by some, some critter trying to colonize your lungs, that's, you, you're going to mount an immune response all kinds of different things of that sort. And most of, a lot of what we see is built around antigen-antibody binding. So uh, these, these uh, antigens, uh, which is to say that they, cre that they generate uh, this kind of response, are, are sometimes called immunogens as well, are molecules that are capable of being recognized and bound by the immune system. When we say antigen, we are talking about something that is antibody generating. Right? So if you have some particular molecule that your body responds to with an, uh, an, an antibody, that's a, that is an antigen by, by definition. So immunogens are antigens capable of stimulating an immune response with, that may be either humoral or cell-mediated. We talk about, uh, some, you'll sometimes hear the term haptin. So this is a small molecule 
that can elicit an immune response, but only when it's in complex with a carrier molecule. So it may be, for example, that uh, a, uh, um, a, a small molecule by itself does not cause an immune response, but as soon as it's uh, bound by another protein, it would. So that's called a, a haptin. Okay. So antibodies are uh, a really important uh, biological compound, that, uh, or a biological entity that we all need to understand well. Um, antigens have, uh, sorry, uh, antibodies have a rather complex structure uh, that uh, part of which would be well represented in a sequence database and other parts which wouldn't be. Um, because the antibodies that you create and that I create are likely to have different sequences in a lot of places. So our, our bodies have a huge number of, of um, have a huge vocabulary to draw from in creating these, these, these responses to antigens. So in general, we can speak of the antibody consisting of a heavy chain, shown here in blue, and a light chain, shown here in green. Both heavy chains and light chains have constant regions, here shown in a lighter color, and variable regions that are shown here in the darker color. So if you think of, the, uh, of these constant regions as kind of the structural backbone of the antibody, you should think of those variable regions as the parts that can change to allow for the recognition of arbitrary molecules. So um, we see that, that we have kind of this Y structure, but it's not just one protein, right? It's multiple, um, it's, it's light chains being married up to a heavy chain. We have a fairly complex structure beyond just the amino acid sequence of this. So it would be nice to think of the heavy chain as just you know, some, uh, some uh, peptide bond linked set of amino acids. But in fact, we have more bonds that are forming to hold these heavy chains together in this in the stem formation. So those are disulfide bonds. Disulfide bonds are formed through what amino, amino acid? Cysteines. Cysteines, right. So these cysteines are a structural component <coughs> of holding this Y structure in place. Another part that we don't often think about is that these, uh, these are actually glycoproteins. There's a large sugar attached to the structure as well that is also functionally important. Very frequently, we just leave it right out of the diagram, but it's a pretty important factor. So why is, a, why, why is an antibody able to bind a particular antigen? It's because of the antigen binding site. So we imagine that this little, uh, this little brown cloud here looks like a bit of cauliflower. Uh, represents an, an antigen. This is the thing that this molecule is going to re uh, recognize correctly. So the sequences down here at the, at the far, at the tips of the Y, so to speak, are the parts that have uh, uh, been produced through sequence customization, basically, that a particular B cell is creating a particular antibody that has this particular sequence known to interact with this antigen to which the body is exposed. All right. Um, I don't want to go too much further into that, but that's, that's the, the, the basis for this. So we sometimes speak of uh, an antigen and an epitope. Do people know the distinction between those two? Okay, so we said that the antigen is the thing that we're binding to, uh, the, little, the little bit of uh, cauliflower there on the end. Okay, so the epitope is the, uh, is the part of the antigen that we recognize. All right, so an antigen has an epitope, the, um, the peritope, on the other hand, is the part of the antibody that actually links to that epitope. So a, um, sorry, a peritope on the antibody connects to a epitope on the antigen, and that, that's what allows us to make this very specific recognition. So if you're, if you're being very simplistic in, in molecular biology and you're, you're not an immuno immunologist, you, you might just start thinking of these as these little Y-shaped molecules that, that stick to things very, very specifically. But that's not really a very complete depiction. So I, I would ask you this. If you have an antigen that is, um, that's infecting a bunch of people, let's say it's a virus or something, um, is it proper to expect that every person's antibody that encounters that virus will create an, anti an antibody that, that attaches to the same epitope on the antigen? No, because as I said, the antibodies I create are going to be different than the antibodies you create, and 
Thus, you may have very different epitopes on the same antigen that are recognized by different people. Okay, so that's, that's a fairly complex bit of, of story, but I think understanding how antibodies work is really important. One of the things we're not talking about is how the body settles on a set of, anti, uh, of antibodies, how, how our bodies decide which sequences they will create, and frankly, that's a little beyond my ability to comprehend. The, the way that our bodies can shuffle together sequences that uh, allow us to recognize novel antigens is actually kind of amazing when I've heard people describe it. Okay, so an immunoassay is basically hijacking this bit of, of machinery that our bodies create. Um, if you're using uh, an antibody from a mouse or from a rabbit, um, that there's no reason that, uh, that these antibodies can't be used to detect the same pathogens that attack us, right? So if you, if you know of an antigen that attacks a person, you might inject a rabbit with uh, uh, a bit of that antigen in hopes of raising an antibody response that you can then hijack the, the, the antibodies from. Okay, so typically we're seeing that we're using immunoassays. Now I note that immunoassays are generally about using antibodies to do a particular detection, but you can also do this in reverse, which is to say that if you are looking to see if somebody is producing an, uh, an antibody response to a particular antigen, you may go fishing with the antigen to see if their antibody comes out of the mix to recognize that antigen. Generally speaking, we're, we're using these inherent properties of antibodies plus a little bit of molecular biology to give us a detection and quantitation apparatus. We want to be uh, accurate and we want to be sensitive, but at base, the thing we really, really must have from our antibodies is, is specificity, which is to say that an antibody makes a good, uh, good interaction with this antigen and no other. <laughs> because if you have cross-reactivity, if you have an antigen, sorry, an antibody that recognizes all kinds of things, your ability to be specific about what you're measuring goes right out the window. Okay, we frequently see the terms polyclonal and monoclonal, uh, monoclonal used for describing antibodies. Have people heard those terms? Okay, do people know what those terms mean? Okay, some do, some don't. All right, so it may be that if you are uh, using a raised, anti uh, a raised antibody, uh, you, you've actually exposed an animal to this antigen, and many different antibodies have been created that all respond to that antigen. It is, in effect, a mix, a collection of antibodies from different B cells, B cells being the little factories for these guys, different B cells may be generating multiple antibodies that all react to different epitopes on the same antigen. So to say you have a polyclonal antibody is already kind of a misnomer. A polyclonal antibody is a collection of antibodies, not just one antibody. All right. A monoclonal antibody is typically produced by a particular B cell, a, a particular B cell strain, and therefore there's, it's, there's just one epitope on that antigen with which it reacts. So a monoclonal uh, may not give you the sensitivity that a polyclonal antibody would, because it's only going to recognize uh, this, this one site. But because it's only got that one recognition site, the specificity should be much higher. Okay, so generally speaking, the, the, the way that this is going to translate in the biotechnology of immunoassays is that we get a binding between antibody and antigen. There's some sort of intensity of light associated with that. Um, and we're gonna talk about reporting in a bit here. And that intensity, is our measurement of quantity. Okay, so we need to get the, the binding to take place, we need to be able to translate that into an intensity of some sort of reporting, reporter, and we're gonna translate that into quantity. We'll talk about each of those pieces. All right, so how is it that this binding of uh, an antibody to an antigen could be measured, right? It's, it's not enough that the antibody just connects to the thing, we need to have some readout from that. So we would note that you can uh, link a, a radioactive isotope to your, uh, to your antibody. So if you uh, are able to put a, an epitope down, uh, you can see whether or not an antibody has linked to it by whether or not there's radioactivity there. Now that's kind of old school, but it is a really sensitive way uh, to go after uh, such a signal. It may be that you're using some sort of enzyme immunoassay uh, and you use something like a chromogen, 
Uh, so this is a molecule that allows you, when you dope in a certain chemical, to see a color change associated with it. Um, this has become very popular for a lot of the consumer tests that we see. So uh, seeing a color change is your flag that yes, this antibody is here. It may be that you have a fluorescent tag on, on the antibody. So instead of looking for scintillation counts, basically, what you use with radiation, you're looking for a bit of light at a particular frequency um, in response to like uh, a laser you're shining on the sample. So fluor uh, fluorescence can be very, very sensitive uh, for, for measurement. You may also have something like chemiluminescence, where the light is being produced by the sample itself. Or you may use something like uh, an immunochro immunochromatographic assay with like collo colloidal gold uh, uh, nanoparticles uh, being there to uh, produce a visible color. So there are lots of different ways that you can translate this binding into some sort of signal that you can measure, whether it's a color change or light emitted or a um, uh, you know, radiation. <laughs> so lots of different strategies we, we can use for that. Okay, so we're finally getting down to ELISA. ELISAs are uh, very useful tests that uh, are that represent kind of the most direct ways that we translate the appearance of a particular antigen into a uh, a detection. We very frequently use uh, ELISAs for stuff like uh, like PSA and all sorts of other tests, but they, it stands for an enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay. We have a lot of different pieces to this, um, so we're, we're just going to start with how we capture the antigen in the first place. So it may be that you are uh, looking for all kinds of compounds that are present in some sort of biofluid. And if you're, uh, if you're not functionalizing the surface of, these, uh, of, of your detection, it may be that you're just trying to get all the antigens to just sort of line that chamber, right? So here we see that in direct capture, we have all of these antigens that are just belong directly to the surface of a well. And that's fine if that's what you're after. But frequently, we find that we want our surfaces to be functionalized with antibodies, which is to say that we have some antibody that we know makes a good connection with these antigens. So that out of the mess, the mess of all the different molecules uh, of the samples that we introduce to the wells, the only ones that are going to stick to this surface are those that, ma that made up with those antibodies. So this, this is the case where we're using um, a, a capture approach that's dependent on antibody uh, recognition of a particular antigen. So up above we have our direct capture, down below we have indirect capture. You can see that the other molecules that were available in this mix are not sticking to the surface because they don't mate with the, with the antibodies that are lining that surface. Indirect capture is very frequently what we see used in what's called a sandwich assay. Uh, so this is, the, this is the bread of that sandwich, this is the meat. Uh, we've got our uh, uh, the antibodies capturing just that particular analyte out of the mix. Alright, so how do you tell whether you have a, an, antibody that, uh, an antibody binding to your particular antigen? One of the things that we're going to do in indirect capture is basically ignore uh, you know, the extent to which this lawn of antibodies has been mated up with uh, antigens. Instead, we're going to use a second antibody to the same molecule. So you see that we had different antibodies in, in action here. One is just acting to capture those molecules out of the mix. The second one is showing up on the top to enable us to report on the presence of that antigen. So here we, we have a second antibody coming in and it's got this little HRP associated with it. Do you know what that is? Horseradish peroxidase, one of our very favorite enzymes out there. Okay, so by adding a substrate to it, we can get a signal out of this horseradish peroxidase to reflect the presence of bound antibodies for detection here. So that's an example of direct detection. You could imagine then that this antigen has one epitope that allowed it to be captured indirectly by the surface, and it has a second epitope that corresponds with the detection antibody. The detection antibody in, in its own right has been attached to horseradish peroxidase, which allows us to do reporting. But I would note that each of these antibodies gets basically one antibody for detection attached to it, because this antibody has 
one epitope that, that, um, that it recognizes on the, uh, on the antigen. So that limits how much signal you're going to get back in response to the arrival of each antigen. Do you see that? That's a process of direct detection. So frequently, what we'll do is to use one antibody for detection that's not labeled in any way, but for which we have other antibodies that can recognize it. So you see in this case we have one antibody for capture, one antibody for detection. In this case we have one antibody for capture, one antibody for um, to enable detection, but a third set of antibodies up here that are actually bringing in the horseradish peroxidase to do our, um, our detection. And the value of this is that one uh, one uh, detection antibody can link, link to multiple antibodies for detection, which means we can amplify the amount of signal we get for each antigen that's been captured. So in the prior slide, we talked about direct versus indirect capture. Here we have direct versus indirect uh, detection. So one of those is enabling us to be very specific about what gets stuck to the well. This one allows us to be uh, to amplify the signal that that could uh, be produced, um, thus improving sensitivity, but possibly compromising specificity. Remember, remember that the more complex a, a stack of technologies you have to do, um, the, the the greater the chance that you have some sort of cross reaction that creates a signal where nothing is present. Okay. So, uh, to repeat this, this is, uh, you can probably see the, um, the direct and indirect uh, models a little better here. We have our uh, capture antibody at the bottom. We have our detection antibody at the top. That's, that's our sandwich in this case. So, direct detection works like this. It's nice for fewer steps, but it doesn't amplify our signal that strongly. In this case, we have a capture antibody. We have a, uh, the, the other part of the sandwich here and the detection antibodies react with that antibody that's been bound to the antigen. So I, I hope that, uh, that close-up kind of makes that a little easier to follow. Okay, so direct ELISAs are lovely for having very few steps. They're, they're faster uh, to perform at the bench. They, few, they require fewer arrangement, uh, re reagents. Um, but you may, re you may find that a, a nonspecific binding of the added antigen could give you a high background with no amplification of your signal. That's going to be problematic if you're going after a really tiny quantity of antigen. And indirect ELISA is, is going to take you longer to perform at the bench. You have the possibility of cross-reactivity, where the detection antibody may be measuring something other than the antigen of, of, of your particular interest. Generally speaking, though, this is highly sensitive and, and quite flexible. But the sandwich ELISA the going the, the uh, having the, the capture antibody, the uh, detection antibody, plus the another antibody that actually carries the HRP, um, is, is going to give you the best sensitivity you can possibly get. But you're probably going to require optimization to ensure that each of these antibodies are doing exactly what you think that it's doing. So capture and detection are, are the matched pairs that form the sandwich, um, and then we have the other HRP on top of that. All right, so you, you might ask, how does this play out in an actual clinical test? Uh, so uh, HIV testing is, of course, something that, uh, that comes along with, uh, with everyday life. Um, and especially in South Africa, with, with such a huge infection rate for HIV, we perform bazillions of these things. So um, in this case, we want to have the ability to detect antigens, yes, but we also want to see whether this person's um, uh, blood contains antibodies against HIV antigens. So you can see that we can look at both sides of the coin. Do, uh, do they have uh, virus particles, uh, uh, or the proteins of the virus particles circulating in blood? And uh, are, are their bodies already producing uh, antibody responses to that antigen? So, our test kits are going to involve both of those to, to screen for the antigens and the antibodies of that person's immune response to it. All right, what are the things I would like to say about this one? Uh, so 
you can then imagine that the human sample is going to contain some amount of P24 antigen. Do people know what P24 is? Okay. Uh, do people know the term capsid? Some folks have heard it and they're not sure where. Okay. Uh, so a, the, the viral protein that, that forms this case in which the, the virus sits is called a capsid. P24 is one of the major proteins uh, produced by the, the HIV, the human immunodeficiency virus, to coat itself. So P24 being this coat protein is effectively one of the major um, antigens that is presented by this virus when it infects somebody. So P24 antigen circulating in blood probably means that the virus is actively spreading um, within somebody. The presence of P24 means that viral coat proteins are being produced. But that person probably has some kind of response that they're mounting to it. Because, you know, people, our, our bodies don't like being virally infected. They, they have all kinds of really boosted responses to that. So it may be that there's a very small amount of P24 and a very large amount of the antibodies that they're producing against it. In this case, we have an IgM and an IgG. Uh, so you can imagine then that P24 is, a, is very valuable. If you detect that, you have direct evidence of the virus in this person's blood. If, however, you detect antibodies to it, you can also see that this person's body, that their immune system is responding to that antigen. So you might detect that there's, you might detect a, a very small trace of, uh, of an antibody um, and not be able to detect the P24 because it's present at a very low level if they're having a pretty good response on it. But uh, generally speaking, we would, we would hope to find both of these to detect both the virus protein and the person's um, response to it. Okay. Now, a lot of times we make use of what are called lateral flow tests as, uh, as really, uh, as field-ready biomarkers. So I think that uh, many people have seen the pregnancy tests that involve uh, you know, basically peeing on, uh, peeing on the, the strip and seeing if the, the stripe appears. This is an example of a lateral flow test. I just want to point out that a couple decades ago, we didn't use lateral flow tests because we didn't have them. We used frogs, right? Frogs built, uh, that were grown right here in, in South Africa were shipped all over the world because we discovered that injecting the frog with a little bit of women's pee would let us determine whether that woman was pregnant or not. This is better, trust me. <laughs> I mean, the frogs are certainly happy that we came up with something other than that, right? So uh, you can imagine then that a little bit of analyte is going to be involved, right? We're probably going to have a drop of blood or a drop of urine in this case uh, from someone. And that urine uh, or that blood is going to contain some small amount of an antigen that we care about. Here those are shown by these little, um, uh, these little uh, red crosses. All right, so we have some antibody uh, that, is, uh, uh, that can uh, uh, attach to an epitope on that antigen. Uh, so as these molecules come by, as they move laterally, sideways, into the machine, the, uh, the, the, those uh, antigens then marry up with these gold um, nanoparticle uh, conjugated antibodies, and then they reach this test line. The test line represents a, a capture antibody. So we already talked about this as, uh, in, the, in the previous slides. We have an indirect capture, meaning that we have some antibody against some epitope on, on these antigens, on those little red crosses. So this is going to capture them and immobilize them. But in this case, we've added the detection antibody, in this case the gold nanoparticle bearing ones. Uh, those are already bound to the antigens. So these, uh, these antigens show up and they form this sandwich with the capture antibody at the test line, and they've already got the detection antibody on top of it. And this allows us to see, I believe the, the color change here, you know, it turns blue. Um, and we also have some amount of a, uh, a control line in there to confirm that these detection antibodies were coming across uh, with, in, with the flow of the biofluid. So this control line should always come up, but the test line only comes up if the antigen is in place. Or if you have some sort of cross-reactivity going on, in which case it's not much of a lateral flow test, is it? So we can then imagine that a lateral flow test is uh, a much lower tech means uh, 
of doing this immunoassay in the field or in your home, for example. So these are, uh, these are the kinds of systems that uh, have, have really brought immunoassays to the consumer market. So in the case of a pregnancy, you're going to have a, the test line light up and the control line light up. In the case of no pregnancy, just the positive control line is going, to, is going to light up. You won't have a light up for the test line. And in the case of a weak positive, there's an indifferent result. There's, there's not enough of a response for the, the color change to be very complete, in which case you should probably redo the test or use a different type of test for that, uh, for that analyte. Are there any other points about this I should say? Well, the no specialized equipment is a really big deal. I mean, we've, to, to think about where this biomarker survey started compared with how we moved through verification, through how we performed ELISA for the first time on the bench, to a lateral flow test, these are, this is quite a, a long progression, isn't it? We started with a million dollar mass spectrometer doing shotgun discovery. We moved to a less expensive mass spectrometer but doing targeted quantitation on just a few analytes um, to, to verify those biomarkers. We, design, we uh, perfected our, our ELISA test until we were really, really sure that this particular combination of antibodies was going to be viable. And then we managed to get it ported into a lateral flow test so that it could be used by the broad public. That's a long transition. It's many years of research, many millions of dollars, typically, to get from the start of that to the end of that. So these are, this is where most studies involving ELISA are really hoping we can go. Now, a lot of sites are now making use of something called Luminex. Do you know if a Luminex machine is in use here? Well, I would say that I've fallen in with immunologists over at Stellenbosch University, and we've got people who just love their Luminex analyses. There's basically no biomarker study that they're doing that doesn't involve Luminex. So I, I, we spend an awful lot of time thinking about these. Luminex assays are really valuable because you can do many, you can test for many analytes all at the same time. So in one experiment, instead of getting a measurement for, yes, this does, in, uh, this does uh, produce um, interferon gamma, you can be testing for a whole set of cytokines all at once. So that's very powerful. In some cases, people have used up to 500, measured up to 500 different analytes in just a single drop of blood. That's pretty darn impressive. Um, generally speaking, people are not designing their own antibodies for use in Luminex assays. Instead, they're buying the beads with the antibodies already conjugated to them. So if you know that you're interested in cytokine panels, then you might buy a kit associated with cytokine panels. If you're working in uh, house cats, maybe you're going to buy house cat specific antibodies uh, not human ones, because after all, the sequences that we produce for different uh, circulating markers can be quite different. So this is the Luminex machine. We've got a, a couple different uh, models uh, for use over at Stellenbosch if you uh, are interested in taking part in that kind of research. So we would start with the idea that Luminex is working from beads. Now, I've been spending a lot of time talking about antibodies, and now I'm talking about beads. But uh, um, I would point out that uh, beads that are immobilized on a well or beads that are immobilized to particles are not that easy to manipulate. On the other hand, if you can create uh, beads that, are, that have a whole lawn of the same antibody on them, uh, you, can, uh, you can treat that as, as, a, as an ELISA in its own right, basically. But this bead has um, lots of different antigen, uh, uh, sorry, lots of different, that's like many copies of one antibody on them. The other thing that's really important is that they're color-coded. The, the Luminex uh, beads are designed to, to report their identity to the Luminex machine. You hit it with a particular laser, and the frequencies that come back off of the thing will tell you um, which, of the, which of the 500 beads that you uh, have in this experiment are in this particular detection. So this one is at uh, coordinate 30 and 10. Um, within the matrix, so that, that tells you, ah, this is my bead for interferon gamma in this case. Great. So uh, you can then imagine that an antigen-specific capture antibody is already bound to the, they're, they're calling it a microsphere here. You can call it a bead, it's okay. Microsphere is much better in marketing literature. All right, so an antigen from the test sample is bound to the capture antibodies. So you started with a bead covered with antibodies. Now those antibodies are bound to these little yellow antigens out of the test sample. 
signal is generated by attachment of the labeled detection antibodies. It's still just a sandwich assay, right? You still have your capture, uh, your capture antibody on the surface of the bead, the antigen docks with it, then the detection antibody uh, makes a sandwich with it. That detection antibody lets you measure the signal. Okay, so we have a, uh, a, whole, a whole host of these beads all in the sample at once. One of the valuable things that we can do with beads is microfluidics. Almost any time you hear the term bead anywhere in neurobiotechnology, you know that someone's going to be channeling those beads into a, a, a narrow stream of flow at some point. Because once we can do this, once we can do microfluidics with the beads, we can individually measure these beads out of a very complex mixture of millions of these beads to say, all right, is, is this bead present? How much, uh, which antibody does it represent? Uh, which antibody pair does it represent? And which, um, um, which of the, uh, and how much of the antigen is stuck to that bead. So this gives us the ability to, to measure a whole bunch of different antibody pairings for a, a whole host of antigens all at the same experiment. Okay, so a lot of times uh, we would like to know whether this person's blood uh, contains the seeds of response to a particular antigen. So let's, let's talk a little bit about uh, the response that our bodies can mount. If I am, who here has had ch chicken pox? Every, nearly everybody's had chicken pox. You haven't? Oh, goodness. Well, I hope you don't get it when you're 50 or 60, because that really hurts. <laughs> All right, sorry. so oh, it, it's a, a childhood disease. Generally speaking, when we're kids, we get chicken pox. But when you got chicken pox the first time, did you have it again? Anybody have it a second time? This is because our, our, our immune systems learn a response for chicken pox exposure. So because you fought, the, uh, fought off a chicken pox infection once, your body knows if you're ever exposed to chicken pox again. And your body is able to fight off that, that infection before it ever develops into a second round. Sorry, I, maybe you didn't get, the, uh, get it when you were a kid, so that's going to be a little less pleasant if you ever do get exposed. But generally speaking, that's how it works. Now, it is possible that, you have it, that some people would have a compromised immune system. I, I know one person who's had chicken pox three times. Generally speaking, that shouldn't be possible. But in this case, her immune system is just not very cooperative. It doesn't learn very quickly. So um, this, is, this is a challenge. So one of the things you might like to know is, does this person have a specific response to a particular antigen? Now, in tuberculosis, this is how it works out. We have a whole set of antigens that we know that tuberculosis frequently presents. So we've got ESAT6, CFP10, TB7.7. We would like to know, based on a blood sample, does this person, uh, has, has this person's immune system seen tuberculosis and mounted a fight against it before? So we can start with whole blood for this purpose. So um, immune, I, I will not get into all the different cell types that uh, are part of this learned response uh, in immune systems, but I will note that uh, if you can start with uh, a little bit of blood, you can do a nil control, right? So you can stimulate it with nothing and then see, if, uh, see what its response is. You can treat it with antigen ESAT6 and see if, um, it's, uh, if, if it's producing a whole bunch of interferon gamma. This is one of those... Um, interferon gamma is something that we release in response to infections that we've seen before. So if you are producing a bunch of interferon gamma in the baseline blood, then something's already, there's a problem here. The sample's already been stimulated. But if you can stimulate the sample with a bit of ESAT6 and see a change in response, to see that the amount of interferon gamma present in that sample is much higher, that's, a, that's an indicator that you may have a, a TB-specific response. If you can do another one with CFP10 and another sample with TB7.7, these are some indications that this person has previously experienced contact with that disease and their body has a specific response to it. And you should also use, we, we already talked about our nil control here, we may also want a mitogen response. So mitogen is just like jerking a cattle prod into, into somebody. You're going to get a response, right? So using the mitogen, uh, it should see a, a big, uh, sti should stimulate a major response regardless of uh, whether that person's ever seen this or not.
Okay, so these are the kinds of whole blood assays that we may use to evaluate whether this person, uh, person's immune system is aware of this particular danger. Now, one of the things that I didn't spend a lot of time on on Tuesday, on Tuesday was to talk about what samples we like doing shotgun proteomics in. And I would say that blood is like my number one worst place to practice shotgun proteomics. Whenever you have a sample that's really dominated by just a very few proteins, shotgun proteomics is going to really struggle to detect anything. So that's not an ideal situation. However, blood is naturally one of the places where we really like to do antigen testing. So uh, being able to do immunoassays in blood is a very reasonable place to, to do it. However, the bloods that we work with tend to fall in the, into these two types. So in a, a serum sample, we're going to allow coagulation to take place. Does everyone know coagulation? If I say things like platelet and fibrinogen and so on, that, all, that rings a bell with everybody? That's really good. Okay, um, so in my family, uh, the males have a tendency to produce fewer platelets than normal, right? So when, when my dad was in his 40s, I remember going to uh, uh, Thanksgiving picnics with the whole family, and uh, we would all have our family football game out in the pasture afterwards. And in the family football day, that game, Dad was always just playing really, really aggressively, and so he would come home, and the following day he would be covered in bruises, just covered in bruises, because our blood doesn't clot very quickly. Just an odd fact about my family. I, I, I'm the same way, but happily I've never had the extensive bruising problem. So, in this case, we use the fact that blood clots as, an, as a way to get all the crap out of it, basically. So serum is what happens when you let all these blood cells clot and get out of the way at the bottom of the tube. And serum can very frequently contain an awful lot of informative molecules that are useful in immunoassays. But it may be that if you allow blood to clot, that one of the things you wanted to detect is down here in the clot rather than up there in the serum. So that's not ideal in all cases. In some cases, you'll want to do your testing in plasma instead. So if you prevent this coagulation process and spin the blood, you get a whole bunch of red blood cells down here. You get a bunch of leukocytes. I think everyone recognizes this stands for white blood cells, leukocytes, right? And platelets are in this middle layer, and then up at the top is plasma. And it may be that plasma is a good place for you to go checking for a particular antigen. So these are uh, very different ways. I, if you've printed off the slides, I think that this, I, I can't remember if I uh, up replaced the PDF today, but you, you may have a different image appearing at the right on this in, in the slides you can see. So it may be that working with blood, either in the form of serum or plasma, is the, is the common way that you're going to do your antigen testing. It may be that the antigen you're interested in is not found readily in blood, but maybe you're finding a metabolite of a drug, for example, in urine. So certainly you can do an antibody testing in, in, in that area. Some people will use cerebrospinal fluid, um, especially if you've got a disease that's mucking about with your brain's ability to rule out everything else. But frankly, you can find people studying almost any biofluid for lots of different antigens. So saliva, sweat, tears, stomach fluids, bronchioalveolar lavage fluid. Now why would that be on there? Because we work in TB. And remember that in TB, a lot of the testing material we have to work from is sputum. But in some cases, you would like to know what's down in the lungs themselves, and bronchiolar lavage is a process that lets us to sample the lining of the upper sections of the lung. So BALF is one of our, uh, one of our newest friends. You can also see people working in something like ascites fluid. Um, a lot of cancer tumors can develop a, a kind of a sack of fluid uh, around them that uh, we call ascites. So basically, if there's something gross in the body, somebody is looking for an antigen in it. Amniotic fluid, cord blood, certainly uh, people worry about what our fetuses are exposed to, so uh, those are ways that we can sample what, uh, what, what a uh, uh, gestating fetus has been exposed to. All right, so if this is the, the end-all be-all of clinical testing, why do I have a pitfalls slide? Because there are lots of ways to foul this up. Interferences, false positives, false negatives. So a false positive in this case would mean uh, that you went looking for an antigen 
and you detected that the antigen was present, but it really wasn't there. A false negative, uh, sorry, a false negative means that the antigen really was there, but you failed to detect it, and you claimed it was not there. Right? So these, are, these uh, kinds of problems show up in, in antibody testing as well. It may be endogenous interferences, though. What if you thought your antibody was perfectly specific to a particular antigen, but you find that you get a signal from some other molecule that also shows up when you test, for example, in plasma? Right? That's, that's the kind of problem that we're talking about. That is a, a matrix effect, which is to say that the biological matrix in which this antigen is sitting is also contributing its own response above and beyond what the antigen itself is. Okay, um, right, so cross-reaction of antibodies. Antibody specificity is one of the most pressing issues in biomarker research today. We frequently know we want to measure some protein with very high specificity, very high accuracy and sensitivity, but we don't have an antibody that's very specific to it. There are people who've put together whole websites devoted to all the catalogs, uh, to cataloging all the different antibodies known for human proteins, for example. And yet we find that uh, when we try to buy these antibodies and use them, that we don't get as much specificity as we expected, as the, as the manufacturer presented. Because frankly, how many companies are likely to say, well, this antibody is mostly specific to this protein? It's not how they market their stuff. They talk about it, how brilliant it is. So we always find that we're a little disappointed when we, when we uh, purchase an antibody and find that it reacts to more stuff than we wanted it to. Systems-related errors, the probe contamination, carryover, pipetting. Oh my goodness, there are lots of ways to foul this up, certainly. Yes, if you are uh, allowing uh, the uh, a different sample to... Uh, to get into your equipment in any way if you're reusing a device? Uh, is it possible that carryover from the previous sample is causing you to see a positive in a sample that's actually negative? Yes, this stuff does happen. Uh, so those are, those are big issues. The hook effect is kind of a messy one. It might be that you think, okay, I'm trying to detect something very, very sensitively, so I'm going to dump a huge amount of sample into this ELISA. And then you see some weird fall-off effect that the, the measurement seems to fall off in the uh, apparent concentration as you go to higher and higher concentration. Well, you only got so many antibodies in this, in this well that can do the capture. You only got so many antibodies there for detection. And if the number of antigens there is just totally flooding out the uh, ability to do the measurement, you're going to have a problem, right? So this hook effect can mean that even though the actual concentration is rising, the apparent signal can fall. Uh, because of this flooding of all the, the molecules you've got there for detection. This is an example of that, so. Okay, so lots of takeaway messages. Immunoassays are analytical methods that are dependent on antibody-antigen binding, or at least uh, that, that rely upon molecular recognition. You don't have to use antibodies for that purpose, but that is far and away the most common type of molecular recognition used in clinical testing. They are designed to measure the presence and the concentration of analytes in fluid. We're generally not looking for a yes-no answer uh, on, the, on these molecules. We'd like it to be a quantitative answer, a dose-dependent answer. So uh, for this, something that can give us a quantity, not just a presence information, is, is a big deal. They are highly sensitive and specific if you've got the right antibody. We can just go ahead and put that in um, parentheses next to almost any of the claims associated with antibody assays. The enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay, ELISA, is a test that uses antibodies and color change to identify an analyte. I would really, really like everybody to know what ELISA is. Uh, it just seems like the obvious sort of thing to ask a test question about. I don't even know what questions we'll ask, but that one seems very likely. Luminex technology is really valuable as an extension of ELISA because it allows us to do measurements of many, many different antigens, all from the same sample. It's a very powerful technology and not a hugely expensive instrument. These are not million dollar instruments at all. Okay, whole blood assays are really well suited if you're trying to evaluate cytokine production in response to a particular antigen while keeping the physiological environment. That we, we think that we can understand more about someone's immune response um, in a blood sample, even, at, even though that sample's been taken out of their body, that we think that a lot of the immune response is still, um, is still visible from those samples. 
as always, think about sample type. If your sample has a huge array of antigens and a whole lot of com complicating uh, antibodies that it's bringing to the table, that can really mess with uh, your ability to do a decent ELISA from those samples. Okay, so hopefully some of that was recognizable from things that you've seen in the past with immunology sample uh, with immunology classes. Um, if not, I, I welcome to the fine world of antibodies. They're amazing and, and mysterious molecules all at the same time. But I hope that this has been a useful guide in how antibodies play into the fine world of clinical biomarker testing. Thank you. <laughs>